This machine breaks all the rules. It can penetrate some of the toughest terrains on Earth, over land, over water, from the polar ice to the rapids of the Amazon. This is the ultimate frictionless floating machine. The incredible hovercraft. Hovercrafts are fast. They go over land and water and are really awesome. Every month, Jonathan Spedding races his twin-engined Meteor. This is the Formula One race. The hovercraft rides on a cushion of air. It can handle almost any terrain. The craft barely touches the ground as it passes, and on water, there is almost no ripple in its wake. Jonathan's hovercraft has one engine at the front, pushing air into the rubber skirt below to create lift. And another engine at the back provides the thrust that drives it forward. He steers by controlling a rudder right behind the drive fan but he also uses the weight of his body to move the craft from side to side. It looks easy, but it takes extreme skill. And like all motorsports, it is highly dangerous. An ill-judged move at 80 miles an hour will hurl a rider right out of his craft. Today, Jonathan's precise handling and cool control wins him a first prize, a Formula One winner in an amazing race. But his hovercraft is just a baby. Large hovercraft can hover up to 16 feet above the ground. These vast machines are capable of tackling the toughest terrain. As the Americans say, there's no beach out of reach with a hovercraft, and 70% of the world's beaches are accessible by hovercraft, whereas only 10 to 15% are by conventional landing craft. They excel in conditions that would destroy other vehicles. They're more versatile than a boat, cheaper than a helicopter. This incredible machine is a British invention. Today, the Royal Marines Assault Squadron operates a fleet of them. Lieutenant Richard Thurston is in command of the fleet. I think they're great. I think they are one of the best bits of kit going. There are things that you can do with hovercraft that you just cannot do with any other craft. The assault squadron's job is to support amphibious landings. The hovercraft they use are low-tech and low-cost, 
Even so, no other vehicle can match their performance in the extreme conditions of the Arctic. Our hovercraft will travel at 30 or 40 knots straight over water or over obstacles up to half a meter high. Sandbanks, rocks, vegetation, anything like that does not affect hovercraft operations at all. And actually, the hovercraft just lap it up. Above all, hovercraft are incredibly fast. They give the Marines an extra edge. As commanders, it gives us huge flexibility because we can use nearly any beach that we want to. On ice, they can travel even faster, up to 70 miles an hour. The last thing we actually want to do is drop our troops into the water and they have to wade ashore. They start off whatever operation, wet and cold. A hovercraft can take them to the top of the beach quickly, easily, drop down, they unload their kit and off they go. test out the hovercraft's astonishing capabilities and the pilot's skill and control, the Marines use some extremely dangerous maneuvers. are machines for the future. But the concept of riding on a cushion of air dates back more than a century. Boats can't reach high speeds because of the friction between the hull and the water. In 1877, John Thornycroft, a brilliant British boat designer, suggested that trapping air under a boat might reduce the friction problem. He tested his idea with a scale model of a flat-bottomed boat with a recess underneath. Air trapped in the recess lifted the boat almost out of the water, increasing its speed. Later, he built a much more complex model using a clockwork mechanism connected to bellows. The bellows pumped air underneath the boat. As it passed through the water, the air acted as a lubricant, reducing the boat's friction and once again increasing its speed. Sadly for Thornycroft, his boat needed better engine technology than existed at the time. The patents were never exploited. Over half a century later, another inventor took up the challenge and built the first full-sized hovercraft. That man was Christopher Cockerell. His dedicated belief in the air cushion principle earned him a place in the history books as the inventor of the hovercraft. When he unveiled the first prototype of his extraordinary machine, the press was amazed. The headlines called it the flying saucer, but they did not believe it could possibly work over water. So the scientists took it out onto the bay for its first ever flight over the sea. It just sailed off into the water as I expected it to. In fact, they were all rather amazed and I knew it would happen. 
Cockerell was a well-respected engineer. He already had many patents to his name. He knew the hovercraft would work because of his early experiments, using an air blower, two tin cans, one inside the other, and a set of scales. The air from the blower alone hardly moved the scales. But if you expand this by turning it into a circular jet, so that the air comes out in a thin curtain of air like that, then and this will support a bigger load as a hovercraft than using just a straight jet. In 1955, he built a prototype to prove his theory. Once he was sure it would work, he tried to market his idea. I took it round the aircraft industry, but were told it wasn't an aircraft, it was a ship. And I tried taking it round some of the firms that made ships, and they said, no, that's not a ship, that's an air aeroplane. Finally, he approached the British government. They were so impressed that they immediately classified it top secret. Then they sent experts from the armed forces to visit Cockrell. I had a model which was that I made whizzing round and looked very dangerous, and one of them climbed on the chairs to get out of the light of the damn thing. The Navy chap sort of looked up like that and said, <laughs> useless, wouldn't stand any sort of a seaway, wouldn't last a minute. The Army and the Air Force were also unimpressed. It took two more years before the government funded a study of Cockrell's hovercraft theory. Air enters through the inlet at the top. The fan blows it through a circular slit around the bottom. This produces a curtain of air which blows down all around the outer edge of the vehicle, trapping a bubble or cushion of air beneath the hovercraft. It's literally riding on air. After exhaustive testing, the scientists finally unveiled a full-scale prototype in 1959. One month later, Cockrell's amazing invention proved itself once and for all. Cockrell shipped his craft across to Calais, France. Early one morning, the so-called flying saucer set off to cross the English Channel. It was the 50th anniversary of the first plane flight across the Channel. Cockerell was anxious to show that his hovercraft could make the 22-mile crossing just as easily. At first, they made good progress. But as they sighted the white cliffs of Dover, they hit choppy water. For the first time, the hovercraft encountered rough seas. And it was quite a thrill because you got up a wave and then you slid down it nicely and got up another one. And then we shot up the shore at Dover and uh, some BBC chap turned up to me and said, uh, will you come with me and do an interview? And I said, no, I want some breakfast. <laughs> At the same time that Cockerell was trying to interest the British government in hovercraft, an American inventor in a small Illinois town was experimenting with his own version of the air cushion vehicle. And we don't always have this beautiful weather in Illinois. And I was a country doctor, and I made house calls. Dr. Bertelson needed a vehicle to cover rough country in even rougher weather to visit his patients. Not knowing about Cockerell's work, he developed his own machine and tested the first prototypes on the town football field. He was amazed at his results. It was a wonderful experience. I thought I had the world by the tail. I thought this was going to be so easy to do. I thought we could get a machine that would be uh, user-friendly, widely producible, and I thought I could dash it off real quickly. It will work just great on a level surface with zero wind. It could go uh, very, very effectively. But on uh, any kind of a groove or any kind of a grade, uh, you had to out tilt a hill in order to climb it. Bertelson was only an amateur, but he was persistent. He was determined to make his idea work. He was probably the first man ever to fly an air cushion vehicle over water. I had no idea what it was going to do, but it flew beautifully and it created enormous spray, but its control system worked. Uh, even on water, I could go forward, backward, sideways, pivot. 
Encouraged by his success, he continued inventing ever more sophisticated designs, testing his concepts to the limit. His bizarre machines all hovered well over different surfaces, but there was a problem. Bertelsen's machines were difficult to steer. Back in Britain, cockerel scientists were also having problems. Their craft did not perform well on high seas or with obstacles more than 10 inches high. They built a new research craft to investigate the problem. Like Bertelsen, they found that it was extremely difficult to control the craft's direction because the hovercraft followed the contours of whatever surface it was on. Then they made a breakthrough. Their new idea was the skirt, a flexible rubberized extension below the craft. It adjusted closely to uneven surfaces and created a good seal for the air cushion. This also increased the hover height of the main body of the craft above the surface, improving its maneuverability. With these new extensions, the craft shot across any surface at terrifying speed. A steep gully or a ridge used to be an impassable barrier. Now hovercraft could fly over obstacles up to four feet in height. The flexible skirt was exactly what the hovercraft needed. In over 35 years, the basic design has hardly changed at all. When a hovercraft starts, fans drive air down into a flexible tube of skirt around the edge of the craft. This high pressure air escapes through holes on the inside wall of the tube, generating an air cushion under the entire floor of the hovercraft. The skirt holds in the air cushion exactly the same way as the can in Cockerell's original experiment. More air is fed down through the fingers attached to the skirt bottom. This helps to contain the air within the cushion. By the early 60s, designers had finally perfected their machine. The British military, who had once been so skeptical, immediately started testing it. Straight from the beginning, the military could see the application of hovercraft. They weren't sure if it was going to be Navy or Air Force or Army, so they all had to go. They set up an inter-service hovercraft trials unit, and they sent hovercraft to every corner of the world in every environment, and really put hovercraft through their paces. They took a 350-mile round trip into the heart of the Libyan desert, over terrain that would destroy any conventional vehicle. The craft was powered by a single Rolls-Royce gas turbine engine. The sand wore down the edges of the skirt and clogged the engine intakes. But these problems were trivial. No other vehicle in the world could have even attempted this incredible journey. Next, the research team took the hovercraft to the Canadian Arctic. Once again, the craft amazed them. Over the swept surface, maximum speed exceeded 60 miles an hour. An all-up weight of 16,000 pounds, short slopes of one in three, and a vertical height of over 17 feet were negotiated.
the craft occasionally iced up, and the skirt inevitably took some damage. But the hovercraft completed another torturous journey with ease. The expeditions had finally proved the new technology. The designers developed new hovercraft, specifically for military applications. Armed forces around the world wanted them, impressed by their amphibious capabilities. The manufacturers were overwhelmed with orders. At sea, the hovercraft is stealthy. Because it flies above the water, it has low magnetic signature, and sonar cannot detect it. Hovercraft also have the unique capability of being able to fly over mines without detonating them. And even if a mine did detonate, hovercraft are immune to underwater explosions. Incredibly, they are also safe from land mines. Their minimal pressure on the ground gives them almost complete immunity. Hovercraft are the only vehicles capable of fast amphibious assault, landing troops dry and ready for action. In the Far East, the British military used the hovercraft's unique amphibious capabilities to patrol land accessible only by river, navigating rapids with ease and opening up once impenetrable parts of the jungle. In the Bay of Hong Kong, the Royal Navy maintained night and day hovercraft patrols to intercept and deter the illegal immigrants. The presence of these intimidating machines also deterred drug smugglers. But despite people's enthusiasm and the success stories, no one was improving the technology. New hovercraft were no better than the generation they replaced. Then the US Navy got involved. The American public first met the hovercraft in 1963. It was used as a ferry, carrying commuters across San Francisco Bay. It attracted enormous interest and rapidly became a popular way to travel. The backers of the new commuter line are optimistic over the future of their service. They feel that the low-flying hovercraft have a high-flying future. In 1967, the U.S. Army and Navy took British-designed hovercraft to Vietnam. This war machine could go places no other vehicle could. It traveled effortlessly through the swamps. The troops used it to seek out the Viet Cong. During the 1970s, America took the technology from the British and built the next generation of hovercraft. These prototypes were tested to their limit. The military was impressed with the craft's incredible resilience under fire, and especially with their immunity to mines. They also performed well in the most extreme environments. After years of research and development, these prototypes evolved into the ultimate amphibious machine. Bob, this is to operate. One and two online. All right, let's go. Roger. This is the state-of-the-art hovercraft known as the LCAC, or Landing Craft Air Cushion. I think that the British have taken the hovercraft to one level, and we've taken it from there and just moved on with it.
the LCACs weigh 100 tons each. They carry four gas turbine engines of 4,000 horsepower, a total of 16,000 horsepower. fan module you have two lift fans on either side of the boat they generate all the air that gives you lift and some propulsion right here you have a, a the gearbox and the hydraulic system the engines sit perpendicular to the drivetrain the filtration is is a lot like a helicopter marine gas turbines don't like dirty fuel and they don't like dirty air so the filtration system is is designed to take out everything under the sun the prop is a uh, carbon fiber, it's 18 foot in diameter and it's shrouded by uh, a aluminum skin that you can see. Behind the prop is a set of two rudders. Those are what's used to, to steer the after end of the boat along with uh, variable pitch propeller. The technology is phenomenal. From the old days of the old conventional landing craft to what we have now is apples and oranges. The LCAC transports Marines and their equipment between ship and shore. They can carry up to 75 tons of equipment over 200 miles. Their motto is, no beach out of reach. Learning to fly this amazing machine requires high-tech training techniques. This LCAC simulator cost $30 million. The computer controls in the cockpit use fly-by-wire, the same technology that operates in F-14 aircraft. Where are we doing? What are you doing? Up. That way, I. Hold on there. Hold on. We crashed. After just 18 weeks, the enlisted trainees have the opportunity to practice maneuvering the real thing. There's no margin for error. Landing the LCAC on a ship demands extraordinary skill and nerves of steel. The Navy has commissioned 91 LCACs, divided into two assault squadrons. This base on the west coast houses half of them. It covers 45 acres and holds 750 personnel. Each craft costs over $23 million. The Navy has committed $3 billion to this technology. Before, it used to be only pilots that could get all the glory, and now you have enlisted guys that are flying something that costs as much as an F-14 does. So I went from being low man on a totem pole to being a, one of the front runners in technology. If you can envision a jet airplane flying over, you see the airplane and then you hear the noise, that's the same way with our hovercraft. They're very loud, but you don't hear the noise until they're on top of you. The squadron calls itself the Swift Intruders. have seen action in the Gulf War and in Somalia, where they withdrew the UN troops. They have also delivered aid in Bangladesh. The 
the hovercraft, a cutting-edge war machine. The challenge for these incredible craft is to find a role in peacetime. In 1962, the first ever experimental passenger hovercraft went into service, ferrying people from the seaside town of Wallasey in England across to Wales. The good thing about hovercraft in the ferry role is that there really is nothing as fast as a hovercraft. And so where there's an area where you want speed and where people have to get around quickly, hovercraft come into their own. traveled at over 70 miles an hour. The 40-mile crossing took just 25 minutes. Things like turnaround times become a big difference with hovercraft. They can just fly up the beach, there's no docking involved, and the hovercraft straight up and loads, and it's off again. The experiment was a success. Three years later, the first scheduled commercial service began, running from the British mainland to the Isle of Wight. It was an instant hit with commuters. Nothing special about my job. I go to the office every day like lots of other people. Only down here, we commute by hovercraft. Just like getting on a bus. We could go by boat, of course, but hover travel is, well, quicker. In fact, the four-mile crossing took less than 10 minutes. The service is now the oldest in the world. In the last 31 years, it has carried 15 million passengers to and from the Isle of Wight. Today, they use a modern craft with a more economical and much quieter diesel engine. But there's nothing quiet about this monster. This is the huge SRN-4, the largest civilian hovercraft in the world. It crosses the channel from England to France. 10, 10 the front, the front. Yeah, just control. Uh, much. It can carry 384 passengers and over 50 vehicles. It's 91 feet wide and 185 feet long. It weighs over 300 tons. Its massive engines drive the world's largest propellers, 21 feet in diameter. Underneath, there are 20 tons of skirt, costing seven and a half million dollars. At 16 feet, it also has the deepest hovercraft cushion in the world. Since the service began over 30 years ago, these enormous hovercraft have transported 70 million people and 10 million cars. The controls are more like a plane than a boat, but they have a logic all their own. The controls are quite simple. In order to move the craft bodily to the left or to the right, I would move the handwheel to the left or to the right. To turn the craft about a vertical axis, in other words, turning the craft on the pad or at sea by moving the rudder bar with my feet to the left or to the right to initiate a left or right turn. 
I can, however, additionally turn the craft by use of differential pitch on the pitch levers here. challenging because no two days are the same but I have to say that I've been doing this for 20 years and I feel more happy going at 60 knots than I do at 16 knots. To me there is safety in speed. You can outmaneuver any other traffic in the channel. The analogy is you're being stuck in a traffic jam or a tailback of some sort and you're on a motorbike and you just weave in and out of the stationary traffic. Avoiding other traffic is critical. The English Channel is the busiest sea lane in the world. It's 23 nautical miles. It's faster than the tunnel. Just under 35 minutes is our average crossing time. The SRN4 holds the record as the world's fastest ferry. In service, it cruises at 70 miles per hour. But in trials, with no passengers, this giant has reached over 80. Every night, technicians raise the craft onto ramps and inspect the skirt for damage. The skirt is divided into sections joined together by rip stops to ensure damage cannot spread. Altogether, 117 fingers hang from the skirt. These are the only part of the craft which has contact with the surface, so they wear out the quickest. On average, they replace 21 fingers every week at $500 apiece. The cost is high, but safety is paramount. Only two hover ferries have ever been wrecked. In 1985, in heavy seas, the SRN-4 smashed into the harbor wall. The hovercraft crash. Police now think four people died. The damage to the Princess Margaret is extensive. A 40-foot hole in her starboard side, and the passengers who were sitting here were simply hurled into the sea. A company spokesman said if she'd been a ship and not a hovercraft, she would have sunk with 370 passengers on board. In 1972, the smaller Isle of Wight hovercraft overturned in a Force 8 gale. The passengers survived the accident, but five died when firemen cut a hole in the upturned vessel. Seawater flooded in and drowned them. 250 million people have traveled on a hovercraft, and over 60, 70 million cars have been moved. And there's only really been two major accidents in all that time. So hovercraft, statistically, are the safest form of transport in the world. Safest and also the most versatile. Today, this amazing machine is in use in some of the most remote locations on the planet. When hovercraft were first mooted, they were seen to be a ferry of the future. But the reality is very few hovercraft are running as ferries. The best place for hovercraft is miles away from people working in remote locations. So hovercraft have been working away very quietly, tucked away, and I think it's been a very well-kept secret. Hovercraft are in active service all around the world. This hover freighter carries gold ore from mines in northern Canada. This is the world's first purpose-built hover ambulance in service in Queensland, Australia. And this craft is specially designed for airport rescue in New Zealand. Off both the east and west coasts of Canada, the Coast Guard uses hovercraft in place of traditional lifeboats. 
hovercraft gives you speed, plus the amphibious capability allows you to go straight to where the action is. They use them for search and rescue, surveillance and pollution control. They run missions up to 10 times a day. They're always on standby. The machines are left hot. They sit with full power on uh, from ground power, and then we just start and leave. And the base is designed in such a way that the machine will be up to almost full speed using the slope of the ramp when it hits the water. Hovercraft are especially useful when the sea freezes over. Coast guards would otherwise be unable to operate at all. Hovercraft break the traditional rule of length to breadth ratio. Uh, you can't have a barge shaped high speed vehicle. You couldn't in the past. That's why a destroyer's long and thin or a fish boat's short and wide. Um, hovercraft break that rule by, by lifting out of the water. Thus, you can have a high speed barge or work platform. On ice, hovercraft are in their element, simply gliding over the surface. But on the east coast of Canada, hovercraft are used to actually break up the ice. There was a large platform called Act 100 up in the Canadian Arctic, and it was being moved and broke up an ice road, much to the chagrin of the locals. That wasn't supposed to have happened. We've turned that so-called disadvantage into an advantage, and we're now breaking up to four feet of ice using a hovercraft. Operating at temperatures as low as minus 40, they work quickly and efficiently. They can break up three square miles of ice every hour. A conventional ice-breaking boat would be no competition at all. As the hovercraft passes over the ice, it sets up a wave action. As the ice bends, it cracks. Amazingly, the ice fractures without the craft actually touching it. Dispersing the ice now prevents dangerous flooding in the spring. The huge slabs simply float downstream. Pirouetting on the ice this way, they can clear a whole river in a day. But not all rivers are this easy to negotiate. Hovercraft have proved their true worth operating as expedition vehicles on trips to the ends of the earth. In 1968, this expedition navigated the Amazon. These violent rapids were the final leg of a 4,000-mile journey. They knew that no powered craft had ever shot these rapids and survived. The explorers had staked their lives on the abilities of this amazing machine. It's not what the hovercraft is, which is spectacular. It's where the hovercraft can go. It can go to places where people just cannot reach. Over the last 23 years, Mike Cole has completed five expeditions taking his hovercraft all over the world. He was the first man to explore the upper reaches of the Amazon in Peru, working against the current. Once there, he set up a hovering medical service. It's a communication link to link the isolated, you could call them the disenfranchised people, the people who never get aid, to link them into the sources of help. His latest journey was the most extraordinary. Mike and his crew set out to cross Central America in their new, sturdy Griffin hovercraft. 
They were the first ever to make the 400-mile journey from the Mosquito Coast of Nicaragua to the capital, Managua. By using a river which is unnavigable by boat, in fact, you're preventing the alternative, which is carving a, a, a muddy track through the jungle. So they are environmentally positive in every respect. You know, when you're going over the water, the fish underneath don't even know you've gone by. And they produce virtually no weight whatsoever. We hit about four and a half miles of leathery lechuca en route to Managua City. And the hovercraft showed its unique capability. We got over the top and went on towards the city. When they ran out of river, they simply headed overland towards the Pan American Highway. We did have a problem because the Pan American Highway, being a first-class road, was cambered. And of course, the hovercraft follows the, the camber of the road. So we did just have to tether it for a little way and give it a, give it a helping hand. And even a hovercraft needs gas once in a while. All across the developing world, there are situations where this unique British invention can make all the difference to the standard of living of very isolated people. But the countries who need to buy them do not have the hard currency to do. Over the past 40 years, the hovercraft's astonishing capabilities have made it invaluable in many roles. But how will we use its unique advantages in the future? The answer could well lie here in sleepy Neponset, Illinois, home of Dr. Bertelsen, the man whose early hover designs lost out to the British. He believes his latest invention may become the revolutionary transport machine of the future. The uh, status of automotive travel in the U.S. and ever in the world is, is really getting worse and worse. And so I felt that an alternative transportation system was possible, and I thought this was it. Guidance is the thing that is lacking in wheels, and we have guidance. Ultimately, I expect this to replace all automobiles and all roads. Now, they can still have their automobiles and their roads. This will be elevated above them. It will go across other rights of way, other buildings. It will go across country, elevated, very inexpensive. Automation means that you do not have to drive. And if you're free of, of, of actually driving the machine, it could be programmed to go anywhere. For instance, when you uh, arrive at your destination, the machine could return home to its one parking place. Would eliminate square miles of parking places everywhere in the world. Tunneling is very inexpensive now. The construction cost would be very cheap. It is the most smooth ride in the world. There are no potholes, for instance. The uh, vehicle would not cause any wear to the right of way. It would just uh, simply pass over it without touching and it would last forever. There are so many virtues to this particular system that it's going to be irresistible in the future. But at present, the U.S. Navy are the ones with a vision of the hovercraft's future. Their massive amphibious landing craft, the LCAC, For Britain's cross-channel ferry, time is running out. Despite their speed, there are no plans to replace these two aging giants. The service will continue only as long as the spare parts last.
To mark their long and inspirational reign, the huge craft celebrated 30 years of service by carrying their most dedicated supporters out to a sandbank in the middle of the English Channel. Some of them brought their own hovercraft. Passionate believers think this incredible machine has a future. Maybe the golden age of the hovercraft is yet to come.